Uh, so we'll start, inshallah, with a question on, uh, related to both the study you mentioned and the conversation beyond that, uh, which is with extreme parents. Uh, so many, you know, many times youth may leave the faith because of a forcing of wearing hijab, praying, fasting, whatever it may be uh, in terms of practice. So if you can comment first on whether the study provided any insight on uh, extreme parenting and the effects of that uh, or the cor potential correlation with atheism uh, in that. And then inshallah if you can comment as well on, on that as a, as a parenting strategy and, and how we should um, perhaps have an alternative. And I need the mic. Okay, so the study, I mean, I uh, chose to focus on the, um, the portion of it that was specific to the actions and the credibility factors when it came to the parent's behavior. However, the study itself, and I will include it, uh, a link to it in my paper, inshallah, uh, does break down and, and discuss, not in tremendous detail, but does mention that there are other factors, and among them are what they categorized as authoritarian parenting. There were, to be very honest with you, it's a really detailed study. It is very, very technical in nature, tabulations and lots of percentages, and I wouldn't be doing it justice to try to rattle off something without having to actually go through it again. But um, speaking to it from the, what we get from that study, um, because I really summarized it for everyone here, but what we get from that is that, yes, that is a, that is a factor, no doubt about it, um, and this is something, as I said, I alluded to that our own doubt studies have shown that, that where there is such authoritarianism, where, that where there's such, I think you used the word, was it very strict? Um, how, how do we best handle that? The focus should always be, I think, for parents to first look at yourself. Before you worry about what your child is doing, and now I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit of, out of experience as well, but uh, you know, perhaps, in, and, and just from work in the communities that, that where I live, um, but generally, I would say that start with, with yourself and first make sure that you have the correct understanding. That's really the, uh, going back to that uh, point in the paper where we talk about parents need to empower themselves with the correct knowledge. When we have, when we sometimes behave in a manner that can be perceived on any of those um, sort of more fringe aspects of, of uh, our understanding of our, of our deen, usually there's something missing there. I'll say that as a general statement. And what I mean by that is that there's a, the intent behind it is a good one. I don't want to miss something that's really important here to convey. And I'm afraid there's some fear there that something is going to go by the wayside. The problem with it is when we don't base that on something sound, then um, it can have repercussions as in this particular situation where a child might feel that they need to, it's too harsh, it's too difficult, or I'm gonna rebel because it seems unreasonable and almost un unethical or, or unfair, um, given again the current climate that we're living in where everything is being questioned as, as a violation of possible rights, right? And, and of course, much can be falling into that as well, but what's too harsh? Um, what's too harsh is to expect somebody to act and, and do in accordance with, with what you believe is the religion in a ritualistic manner without having a true connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the underlying message here is connecting the child to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most critical thing. So know, know the right answer yourself. What is actually, am I being too demanding? Am I being too harsh? Uh, if, I, if I look at the prophetic model, again, as I mentioned, is a crucial component of this. Did, what did the Prophet do in situations like this? Um, would he demand instantly, I mean, how many people were coming into the deen having, as I said, not just, just encountered it for the first time, but actually having hostility toward it? So what was the response? Was it just zero to 100? Or was it take it a day at a time? And so, again, we could probably talk about these things in lengthy discussion, but hopefully what I'm trying to say is, you know, the, the key message is know fundamentally what's required and then nurture it but connect the child to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of where that benefit, what the good is in it that is coming from having that relationship and ultimately serving what will make you feel complete, content, and have the child choose it, essentially, is, is the objective, inshallah. And so in facilitating that opportunity for the child to choose it, um, may Allah make all of our children amongst those who do, um, what are some of the, the impacts on influences like media, um, mm. perhaps even you know, li the liberal strands of thinking, um, and, and how should those be uh, 
you know, f whether f filtered through or, or discussed uh, within a home with the child, yeah. especially in, in how they influence their family. Yes. That's a great question. And yes, um, didn't talk about too much of the, uh, the outside influences, but I think we generally encompassed it as just, as, uh, you know, the, the climate is very secular, and that's an understatement. So yes, your ch child is likely to be encountering, whether you're a parent today, and you're already seeing this, or uh, inshallah, you're a parent of the future, um, there is so much pressure socially, um, you know, not only from uh, the perspective of what they might encounter in school, but just misconceptions that in general exist about sometimes, and you, some of you may be in communities where, where being a Muslim or being visibly Muslim is a bit of an anomaly. Uh, for those who live in Chicago, we can't relate to that because, alhamdulillah, wherever we go, we're, we're, we're usually in fairly large numbers, but that's not the case everywhere. Um, there is technology is the biggest, one of the biggest areas that I didn't even really get into in, in that overview, but it is a huge component, um, not only for the child, but I would say that all these influences are hitting us as parents first. So some of that is just deciphering what is it that, again, what is Islam? When you look at the Muslim middle, there's a lot of confusion and doubt there to start with, just in, in terms of how I navigate myself as, a, as an adult, um, in, in terms of understanding what Islam is and what it isn't. Because so much is coming at me on a daily basis that's, that's working on my psyche to think that, wait a minute, yeah, I hear this all the time. Or those big book deals that, you know, those are the loudest voices. So your child will come home with this. And, um, my recommendation on this, honestly, would be to, to say, I don't believe that these topics should be, you know, oh, the child is too young, I don't think we should discuss it. I, I, I would differ with parents who might want to shelter the child from that, only because I think it's important at whatever level your child can understand to, to have these conversations from the earliest stages possible. To me, this falls into that bucket of building self-esteem and a strong, confident Muslim identity. In order to have that, your child is going to need to navigate and know what exists beyond your home, which is the safe space, which is a space where, inshallah, the dhikr of Allah is often uh, made and, and, and they can be themselves and be comfortable in their own skin as Muslims. They need to feel that way everywhere they go. And that's not always going to come. Yes, there are many kind and very generous people around us who are not Muslims, who will welcome you, and we know that we generally think well of, of, of our neighbors, obviously, but uh, we don't expect it necessarily as a baseline that they're going to provide that for my child. It's coming from, from you, again, as the primary responsibility to provide that. So going back to um, what they'll encounter, discuss it. Discuss it, try to navigate through it the best you can. Use like-minded uh, companies. This is where resources for parents, just as we're doing with curriculum for MSAs, um, we're trying to get this material out through imams and khatibs on, their, on, a, on a weekly basis as well. We also need beyond your own capacity to read or get online or you know, get the answers through your own uh, local scholars. There's a need to form groups and parenting support groups and groups for our children. It shouldn't just be wait, wait till my child gets to MSA or to be at the youth level. This actually needs to start very young. Um, again, I, I didn't want to really bring myself too much into this personally, but from the time that my children were infants, I was looking for people like me who could sit with me and we could navigate through this together. And obviously, 9-11 actually hit when my daughter was, was very young and my son was just born. So um, they've grown up entirely after post 9-11. And so the need for this is, is critical and I think that's probably the message to, to, to convey here is that you need, do need to talk about it at home, yes. Hope that answers it. Um, and in that conversation and yeah. fostering it with our children, um, what do you, if you can weigh in on the prioritization of uh, what should be taught. So, you know, one may argue there's been an emphasis on fiqh or the external aspects of faith practice. Yeah. Would you say aqidah is more important? What would, how would you yeah. prioritize that learning process for uh, children? Okay. Yeah, thank you again for that question because one point that I did uh, want to mention that I actually realized I, I missed in the overview was that the biggest example we can take from the prophetic model 13 years, if you take the seed on, you divide it into Mecca and Medina, pre-Hijra and post, right? Post-migration. 13 years in Mecca, what was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing? Instilling faith, Iman, working on the heart, working on the building block, the foundation of what it is to be a Muslim 
and to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to recognize that my primary duty is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he defines what those limits are for me. Before even getting into the legislation, which really primarily we can say that the heaviest portions of it are when, after, afterwards in Medina. So the first 13 years is about that. So if we take that as a good guide for ourselves as parents, then focusing more so on the presence of Allah. I love the hadith, it's one of my most uh, you know, beautiful hadith, that favorite hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu where he's riding with the young boy, his cousin, Abdullah ibn Abbas and they're on, a, they're on a mount together, they're riding, and he says, I'll teach you some words. And he says, be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Right? Be mindful of Allah and you will find Allah in front of you. This kind of conversation, that hadith is comprehensive. If you, if you ask, ask from Allah. If you seek, seek help from Allah. What is it doing? The essence of it we can all understand. Again, we don't have to be scholars. We can take from that and understand that it's a connection. So that when I'm not there to do this with you, when I'm not there to show you the way, that this is how, this is where you're going to put your trust, this is what you're going to look for in terms of the guidelines, this is where your accountability will be. Once that's developed, the how-tos and the what-tos, and again, this paper doesn't focus as much on those steps, but that prophetic model is the gateway to that. Um, but the tying the child to um, the basics of our aqidah, yes, and understanding who they are in relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the primary focus, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And, and again, in instilling that um, in the, the journey of a child from infancy to you know, teenage years, um, what role can schooling play? If you can weigh in on Islamic schools, yeah. homeschooling, public school, and what your yeah. thoughts are on all of that. Obviously, that's a very comprehensive answer because no system is perfect in any way, shape, or form, but we need all of it. And so um, I won't get into the debate of homeschooling versus Islamic schooling because there's going to be valuable points on both sides of it. What I will say, and not everyone can provide every resource and not every community has every resource available, we have to recognize fully the challenges that people face in this. This is not meant to be, uh, you know, Here's a solution, and everyone's going to fit neatly into this. No, it's take as much as we can. Again, go back to what is Allah holding us responsible for as parents? He's holding us responsible for arming ourselves with the correct knowledge, because that's part of me being a good Muslim and you being a good Muslim. And then to impart that to the best of our ability, having sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the end of the day, if you have Islamic schooling available around you, you have people who, I would not look so much as how far have they gotten, how much money do they have, and what are they gonna be able to teach my child to be able to get into a good college as the only factors. I would be also looking at who are the individuals who will be teaching my child. What can they, what is the, the manner in which are they going to make, have my child be motivated toward Islam? Or um, is it that, and sometimes the resources and finding those resources is actually the biggest challenge. Uh, while we have you know, really well-intended programs out there, there are going to be some that are going to be more effective than others. So looking for that, and, and maybe at times less is more. It's about quality over quantity. Um, public schools, it's a reality of life. For a lot of people, that is the only option. So the necessary thing to take from that is that that's how many, I used to count, how many hours a day is that in the week? And then make sure that in the time that I give, and I think this is again a crucial message here, a takeaway, investing time in your children. When you invest time in your children as a parent, no matter what they've encountered at, uh, during that, the course of the day, whether it's at school, whether it is at work, they, they never cease to be your child. Um, five minutes of something that brings them back is going to be far more valuable than and, and in encountering whatever it is that they saw for eight hours outside the house. But you need those five minutes. So yeah, it's not necessarily one over the other. It's, it's you need all of it and work with what you have and be connected, be connected all the time and be actively involved. So we're receiving a number of questions about the, the study itself. Inshallah, when Sister Ruhi's yeah. article is up, uh, it will be available Completely, yeah. on the Yaqeen uh, website, and she'll be citing it, inshallah, in her article. Um, for, those for those who are interested, I'll just give you the name, the official. So the official name of the study, it was done by um, Joseph Langston, David Speed, and Thomas Coleman. It is, I think, published July of this year. And um, predicting age of atheism, credibility enhancing, displays, and religious importance, choice, and conflict in family. Uh, of upbringing, and the, uh, the, the journal is Religion, Brain, and Behavior. The, the PDF is open, everybody can read it, but I will link to it, inshallah, for those of you who want to get to it right away. 
Um, and, and for those who are worried about what this study may suggest, there's an interesting study by Dr. Paul Bloom of Yale University that actually shows an inclination towards abstract thinking, consistent with the fitra infancy. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, along those yes. lines, what you know, if you can comment? So obviously, prophetic parenting has stages. There's a different relationship the parent plays with the child at different ages. Mm -hmm. um, if you can comment on that and how the, that relationship can change from you know teenage years versus instructive years when they're children, younger children. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to the, the you know the, that um, wonderful. Um, I guess it's a it's a nice visual for us. The seven 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 has has come from us from our uh, pious predecessors, uh, but essentially that you know you want to. Um, with your child at the youngest stages, it's really, it's, it's all about trying to impart it. And I'm not an early education specialist by any means, and I know probably there are people here who can speak to this a lot more in terms of how cognitive science works, how early education works, but really looking at what methodology is most effective for children at that young age. What does the Sunnah teach us? How did the Prophet system interact with children? In a very loving and a very affectionate kind of, almost like you're, you're really, um, playing with them, but through that you're nurturing and instilling the most powerful messages to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to understand, to encourage them. So it's a very encouraging kind of early uh, process to get them to not forcefully pray, but rather just encourage, come stand with me, come join in with me. Um, you know, the, we have instances where the, the companions are talking about how when their children were little and they were fasting in Ramadan and they would give them toys to distract them um, when the day was starting to get a little bit longer, but they were not, you know, th so that gives an indication that these children were probably pretty young. Now, are they required to fast at that age? No. But this is an encouragement. If you join in, you know, we'll, the, you'll, you'll start to develop an inclination and a joy for it. After that, there's a, a disciplinary period. And again, we have this in the hadith too from the Prophet ﷺ that, you know, to encourage your children to start to pray from seven and then after ten to discipline them when needed. But again, without harshness without excessiveness, reminders. Um, look at the prophetic technique of teaching. There are, there are actually beautiful um, articles written on this and collections available on the 21 steps of how the Prophet ﷺ would teach. Um, or I know of at least one book on just how the Prophet ﷺ would um, correct the mannerisms that in which and the instances in which he would correct. Um, we have that, that narration that I think probably most people are familiar with of the Bedouin who came into the mosque Right and and um, and defecated in the mus in the masjid and how th how the sahaba were the companions were reacting to that but the prophet system took a very um, calm and sort of gentle stance and said no let him be and then gave him sort of the nasiha afterwards so th these are the examples of you know the, yes we do need to discipline but let's be um, very compassionate and empathetic in that or not making someone feel wronged at the onset without providing an alternative or giving them a way out of the situation in a way that won't embarrass them. So that's again between sort of, again if you look at, the, there's no sort of um, necessarily a, a hard line on this but seven, seven, seven. And then afterwards you need to sort of develop that kind of a bond and a relationship that is one of a companionship where your child can come to you and discuss important issues with you no matter what age as they get older. And that's going to be actually I would argue even more important because children depend on parents when they're younger, physically as well, right? For all of our nourishment, literally physically and emotionally, we look to our parents, but a portion of that doesn't ever go away as we're all children of our parents, whether we're, they're living with us today or not. Um, but we want to take advantage of that relationship as our child grows older and becomes an adult. And again, we have beautiful examples in the Sira. If you look at the way the Prophet system interacted, his own, um, you know, we look at Ali, who came into the prophetic household very, very young, but eventually becomes a, you know, a very strong and um, you know, just an amazing character amongst the, one of the greatest companions to emulate, but also his son-in-law. So you know, this is something that is uh, to see the interaction and to see the, the trust and to see the, the leadership skills, the, you know, having young children sit in the company of older companions to be able to maybe take their opinion, to maybe be able to make them to help have them develop that. Um, one of the things that's missing is the cross-generational thing. Uh, what I mean by that is many times we tend to hover in our own spaces with our own age groups and peers. Children tend to hover, look at your social settings, all the kids together, all the adults together. Um, and I actually learned this years back from Sheikh Asir Burjas. I don't know, he probably won't, we won't get to know this, but he mentioned this, that this is something that we need cross-generational in order to, to, take, to learn from each other, because we can learn from each other uh, across generations.
And, and on the cross generational generational point, um, I, I was you know curious to hear if you have thoughts on catering to children who are second generation versus third generation, um, if there are differences in how to personalize that this spiritual experience, um, or you know student or children who have all sorts of needs, you know perhaps special needs, um, in yeah. personalizing is the Islamic experience for them and instilling that faith in them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, again, a very comprehensive question because it's different things are going to apply to different people, and I'm not sitting up here as a specialist when it comes to um, clinical psychology, parenting in that regard, or, um, you know, education. But what I can speak from is, again, experience and what I see in my community teaching uh, for a number of years in my own community at different levels of youth and children and families and adults. And generally what I would say is that the most important, again, I'll go back to the prophetic model. This is where we take all of our... Um, how to's is that this is that emotional intelligence of knowing how to be effective with any individual we encounter whether they're first generation second generation whether they have a special need whether they have a special circumstance because they've experienced something in life that was life altering for them so knowing where the starting point is um, if we just rattle things off ritualistically or teach our children ritualistically the outcome we can't expect more than just that that when it's time for that ritual perhaps it will be an action but outside of that ritual we won't know what to do with it so it's understanding what's behind those rituals it's understanding to the uh, what is the capacity of the individual i'm speaking with what is the context in which they're living today what are the challenges they're facing and hopefully as their parent i'm very aware of that and i'm connected to the child and if i'm not that's the first thing to do um, inshallah and to work towards building that understanding and then from there to really open the discussion to let's take it a step at a time and one of the most um, I guess frequently uh, look to examples that I take in my in my own life is from the hadith in which we know that uh, the Prophet system taught us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves even if it's like uh, just a little bit but to do things with consistency this is one of the most again very effective and profound and beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so don't expect overnight miracles and overnight changes in anything we're trying to better ourselves at the, in this manner and we also should expect the same from our children is that let's take it in, in installments that are manageable steps um, so I often find myself in with anything breaking it down what are the manageable pieces here that I can take on and likewise for my child that should be the same starting point so therefore if they do have a special circumstance um, or their experience today I think I'm not sure if you met by second generation or third. The context of being able to relate to the parents' experience. Mm -hmm, exactly. um, you know, I was raised entirely in the West, so I don't bring the. But you bring up a really good point, in that sometimes uh, our parents are bringing in the culture that was infused into the religion in what was taught to them from prior generations. And there may be very valuable lessons in that, but we do have to separate. Again, that confident Muslim identity comes from not only understanding what Islam truly is and what it isn't, but it can and does encompass, it, does, it has room for culture, of course. Customs and culture play a, a vital role, but there are guidelines, and the guidelines are given by, um, by Islam, and that's what we have to try to identify is that which is this? Is this Islam or is this culture? And many times that drives the parents. That goes back to the point of parents need to first arm themselves with the correct information. So when a child says, well, I can't relate because you're from this generation and I'm from this generation and you were raised abroad and I was raised here, for example, it's, again, what's going to bring them together? It's going to be knowing what Islam really is. So in some instances, my cultural understanding may not be the right one. Um, and at times it means understanding what is the context in which my child is speaking. I, I didn't encounter that challenge, but I have to validate it first and then work from there. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And inshallah, in concluding the session, the final question um, will be regarding resources. So, of course, yes. you know, alhamdulillah, this is an incredible discussion and hopefully opened everyone's eyes to new insights. Um, and how can we carry it forward? So what, are the, what resources are available to parents uh, who may be struggling with this, whose children may have doubts yeah. and want to handle that situation yeah. properly? And then also what resources are available to children, uh, especially, so you know, one of the questions that came up was families that may not have two parents in the household yes. and may not have that complete control and influence yes. over their children. Um, and, and, and what kind of resources would you recommend to maybe th in the teen years when they're separated from their parents, but um, their parents have a deep you know, commitment to instilling faith in them? So resources come in many shapes and forms, and um, in the paper itself, I will 
cite some, some books for those who are interested in, in reading resources. In fact, I think um, one of the most famous books of parenting in the West and facing challenges, one of the authors is here speaking <laughs> alongside us, actually, in one of the other rooms, um, it was Dr. Bashir. And, and so you might want to check out those sessions. I think also Shahazad Burjas is holding some sessions on parenting and family. Uh, I did look at the schedule here. So immediate resources for anyone who's interested while you're here for the weekend, uh, these would be some. But uh, speaking to just an, at a general level, uh, the first place, again, for us, logically speaking, what we're trying to do here at Yaqeen is to be this kind of a gateway in that looking to first clarify and get the answers to, to alleviate those doubts for ourselves as adults, as parents. Um, inshallah, we are taking this on topic by topic, and, and this will be an expanding project that may Allah put khair in it and barakah in it that will provide a place to start. And then from there, inshallah, the, to, to diffuse that into the communities everywhere and to give access to it. So online is a very good way for those of you who are in communities where it's not readily available in your local masjid, uh, community masjid. But for those who have that, regardless of whether you have it established or not in the way of scholarship within your local communities or classes or things of that nature, is to try to find like-minded people like yourself and embark on that to the best you can. And there are resources online, as I said, to just at least get the basic understanding. Um, that's probably the easiest and fastest way to get going. And then certainly, um, you know, networking through uh, conferences like this and, and, and with, you know, just through, I would say, you know, again, like Yaqeen, there are other institutes as well, inshallah, that will provide a lot of um, basic knowledge in terms of arming ourselves as parents to first know what Islam is. But then for kids themselves, it's really about getting them involved. And I think if we just participate at least at the masjid level, there'll be some reminders on a daily basis, even if they're basic reminders, as to what that, creating that identity, that Muslim identity, that's really the most crucial thing. The rest will come, inshallah, and will follow in terms of building on it, in terms of knowledge. Yeah.